of different ideas. The two that I've been championing, number one, is much higher taxes on them. Yeah. Um, yeah. We can that in Holland a 10% surtax on any income over a million dollars. And um, right from the president's playbook, a, a minimum tax of 25% for anybody with a net worth of over $100 million. Everybody in here with under uh, raise your hand. No, right? <laughs> so, but it raises an incredible amount of money and it doesn't affect anybody's life at all. It's really, really important. Uh, but the other half of that is looking again at the best way to get rich in America is to inherit it. Uh, baby boomers have done pretty well on that. But we have all these kids, black and white and new Americans with nothing to inherit. So we've created the, the child safety bonds um, that when you're born, we, the government makes a federal contribution to what's essentially a 529 type plan uh, for all these children. Uh, the, the CBO says most 18 year olds who have nothing right now, their family has nothing, will have between 30 and $40,000 when they turn 18 that they can use for college, for starting a business, um, or for buying a house, down payment on a house. And their options expand as they get older. As a 35 year old to make different wiser decisions than an 18 year old. So you really limit it as it goes. But it can make an enormous difference over a generation in terms of equalizing um, the wealth of, of the American citizens. And by the way, I think that's the source of so much of the dysfunction in our society today, too the division of so many people feeling left behind. I'll go fast. Number four is artificial intelligence. Um, I took my final exam in Python 3 this afternoon, George Mason University. I'm totally about that. But um, I, I do say this humbly, there's nobody on Capitol Hill who's spending more time working on how to do guardrails for AI. We know it's going to change our lives in lots of positive ways. We just have to be ready for the downside. Um, so we don't want it. You know, the discrimination against women and people of color, for example, um, the privacy issues, and the worst case, the end of the world, things like that. Um, <laughs> two or three quick more things. You know, eight years ago, I started the Suicide Prevention Caucus. We've made progress, so we still were just shy of 50,000 people who lost their lives last year due to, due to suicide. And one of our big initiatives right now is peer-to-peer -peer counseling, because we don't have nearly enough psychologists, psychiatrists, and the like for our high schools or colleges. Um, so this has expanded. And working with John Hickenlooper out of Colorado, we're making that happen. And, and then alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and all of our struggle to get common sense gun laws the biggest thing left on the table is we have starved the ATF. There are 100,000 federally licensed firearm dealers in America. There are 883 ATF agents. So they can't possibly do it. They're supposed to get a survey every year. The average is the once every 12 years. So for years, we're really close in getting the ATF Improvement Act done. And finally, um, I'm the lead with some Republicans. Um, Fitzpatrick from Pennsylvania and others. We have paid family medical leave in the National Defense Authorization Act, just for federal employees, but it's a start. If we get 2 million federal employees with paid family medical leave, it sets the stage for the rest of the country. So you can see, we got a really full agenda, and I want to make as much progress as I possibly can. And let me just say thank you. Um, I've had a lot of different roles in life. This is by far my favorite. And because this is a beautiful, beautiful community to represent, I love you. And you've given me an opportunity to make a real difference. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Next up, I think we're going to have a DNC update. Our DNC member, Dave Lightman, had a, had a work schedule conflict, but he did email me uh, an update and he said three things. Uh, of relevance from DNC right now. One, that DNC gave a million and a half dollars to Virginia for our recent election, uh, which was a lot of help uh, towards our one seat majorities in the House and the Senate. So thank, thank you for that. And we also credit our, our, seat, our senators, Mark Warner and Tim Kaine, for that effort. Also, I know our congressman did a lot of work in that respect, too. So we got to thank our congressman for all the fun uh, in New Hampshire, New Hampshire was not able to move their primary for the DNC rules uh, because their Republican Secretary of State and state government. Uh, so Biden is not on the ballot for uh, in New Hampshire for the primary. 
And New Hampshire will probably not be seated at the convention as well. So we got that going on. Um, in Iowa, they did sort of work out a compromise. They're going to have their usual in-person caucus, but they're going to keep voting open through to uh, Super Tuesday. Uh, so they complied with enough of the, the rule change that they are going to be okay. And there are not any further uh, DNC meetings until the convention next summer. So that, that's where we are right now with Dave's update. And we hope, hope to see Dave soon in the new year. Um, next up, I think we've got some candidate announcements. Uh, we're going to have two... Uh, Two county board candidates announced for us today. Does anybody have a quarter? Got to bring my quarter. Do you guys have a preference on who goes first? James or Julie? You want to talk? Uh, James, why don't you go first? <laughs> And so, if you have someone to introduce you, you have one minute for introductions, three minutes for speech. If no one's introducing you, you can take four minutes uh, to give your speech. And I think we're going to give James the four minutes. I will be timing. Do not go over. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Over the mic. Oh, thank you, sorry. Good evening, everybody. My name is James DeVito, and uh, I'd like to announce my candidacy for the uh, Arlington County Board. And I'd like to tell you about some of the issues that I'm going to be running on. And uh, the first issue I want to discuss with you is a controversial issue, but it's an issue that I believe in with all my heart. Um, if you elect me, I would vote to repeal the missing middle. The missing middle, its proponents say that it's inclusive. But there's nothing, nothing in the legislation that would help uh, African Americans or any other uh, people of color to buy condos. They say that it's supposed to create affordable housing, but there is nothing in the legislation, legislature, that caps the prices that will be charged for the new housing. In short, if it's supposed to be inclusive, if it's supposed to create affordable housing, it's not going to do either of those things because there's nothing in the legislation that will ensure that. Uh, the missing middle is not liberal, it's regressive. What the missing middle will do is increase population density. If you put six condos in the same space where you had one house, you're going to increase Arlington's population by a factor of six. Um, my further fear is that it will lead to gentrification. Um, real estate developers are not motivated by uh, altruism. They're going to look for the places where the real estate is least expensive. Places like Valley Green, which is a very wonderful African-American neighborhood. I walked those streets last, last year when I was running for election. And my fear is that if they pick up the real estate that's inexpensive, that neighborhoods like Valley Green are going to be gentrified. And those very nice people will no longer be with us. Um, the other problem with, with the missing middle is it's going to convert Arlington from a suburb to a city. When you increase the population by a factor of six, you're going to end up with a county that looks like the Boston Corridor, where we have condos, condos, condos. And there are problems with the cities. I, I don't. I, I love cities. I like to go visit cities. But cities have problems that the suburbs just don't have, one of which is crime. If you, you take a look at Washington, D.C. right now, they have so many carjackings and so many people shoplifting that merchants are actually leaving the city. Cities are noisy. There's traffic jams. Um, you lose the green space. Um, suburbs, there are advantages to living in the suburbs. They're quieter, leafy green streets. I grew up in a suburb. I, where I grew up as a kid, we had backyard barbecues, we had block parties, we had Easter egg hunts for the kids. You got a chance to know your neighbors because there were 30 of them, not 300 of them. Um, if you increase population density, you're going to overcrowd the schools. We already had kids in trailers in 2015. Do we want to add to that? Uh, Problem, and the, the the other thing that uh, that I that I would like to do in particular is Arlingtonians never got a chance to vote from the missing middle. 
the county board imposed it. What I would like to do is go from precinct to precinct and have people in Arlington actually vote. And I will report the results as we go. But the long and the short of it is, there are other issues that I'm running on, but the missing middle is what I'd like to make the key to my campaign. Thank you very much. All right, uh, Julie, I see you have someone to introduce you. Let's bring up Alyssa for your one minute introduction. Uh, the Partnership for Public Service says that public servants aren't driven by money, but they're driven by the impact that we make. Instead of asking how to generate profit, one must ask how to make the most good. Uh, it takes a different type of person to swear to uphold and defend the Constitution from enemies, foreign, and domestic. And I'm honored to be here to introduce someone who has. Not everyone who serves our country wears a uniform. In fact, some of us with the most unique, specialized, and, and frank, frankly difficult to articulate skill set have the training to see the things that might happen, that will happen, but not always to prevent them from happening. I'm here to introduce you to someone with decades of experience in the intelligence career field and what I believe is the emotional intelligence to repair some of the lack of trust in our county, like a public servant should do. Before she was hatchacked, combined, she volunteered with Arlington County Democrats. She served as a senior career civil servant in the Department of Homeland Security, where I also served. And most recently, she served as the Assistant Director for Intelligence as the United States Capitol Police. Julie Farnham. I have two young daughters. They are eight, nine years old. They go to Oak Ridge. Uh, their names are Lena and Natalia, and they are my motivation for running. I want to make sure that they see an Arlington that thrives into the future. Um, I want to make sure that we have youth programming and safe spaces for kids to go when they're not in school. Um, I, like many parents here and elsewhere in the county, are very concerned about the drug overdoses that we've seen recently in our schools. And I want to make sure that we have the education, that we have the treatment options, and that we have the mentorship to address this issue. I also want to make sure that we're growing in a smart way for our county. If we truly care about equity and affordability in housing, we need to make the right decisions to make that happen. And so to be clear, just not agreeing with the county board and how they've handled that issue does not mean that I don't care about equity and affordability. I care very much about those two issues. And that's why I wanna make sure that we get it right. Um, I'll make one other point here. Um, there has been a lot of division and distrust in politics across the United States and here in Arlington as well. And in order to rebuild that trust in the community, we need to do a better job at communicating and being transparent with all the residents here and all the stakeholders to the businesses as well. So when the county solicits feedback, they need to be clear about how the comments re received, how many they were received, how each comment was considered and whether or not a comment was incorporated into the final policy and why or why not. Make that transparent. People wanna know that their voices are heard and that they're valued. We also need changes to our FOIA process. So you need someone who knows how to lead in a difficult period of change. I am that person. I have that experience. I have it in spades. Uh, and I encourage you to visit my website, julieforarlington.com. Read the solutions that I've proposed. Um, my solutions are practical and achievable. I only have a couple seconds left, so I can't go into what they are now, but I do encourage you to visit my website. Um, I love this community and I want to give back to it and I hope that you'll support me in doing that. Thank you. All right, thank you, Julie. Let's see, and up next, I think we we go on to Reorg. All right, we're going to Reorg in uh, January is our uh, Reorg. Christina, yeah, comes after us, I think. All right, so nope, go back one. Uh, the filing deadline for our officer positions has come and gone. Uh, these are the persons who have filed uh, for the reorg positions. Myself or chair, 
Yep, let's stay on this one for a second. Uh, deputy chairs are one contested uh, uh, race this year. We will hear from both of those candidates momentarily. Um, but uh, Sarah Lambert for precinct ops, Sarah Florence for communications, Tony Striner is taking over voter support, into Malice Stan as, as treasurer, Tony Weaver for finance. Renzo Oliveri, our new press uh, secretary. Renzo did uh, Latino press and public relations for Terry McAuliffe in his last campaign. So we're really excited to get him on board. Uh, Zach Lennick for outreach, Bo Shreve for secretary, Phoebe Carlson, a volunteer, uh, Bob Platt, Sergeant in Arms, and Fatima Argon for inclusion and equity. We are uh, down a parliamentarian right now, so if you know folks interested in that position, please let me know. Um, go ahead, next slide. And yep, let's go to our deputy chair announcements. Do our deputy chairs want to do a coin toss? Is there a preference or? Paul, well, you got a preference? Uh, Steve, I think you have it that Corey's next. Or, uh, the slides have it that way, but um, <laughs> regardless, I am offering a coin toss if they want one. Corey, I'm going to welcome you up. Is anyone introducing you? Introducer gets one minute, speaker gets three. Get move. Let me know when there's time. Good evening, Arlington Democrats. Uh, it is lovely to see so many familiar faces here tonight. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Yen Shmoo. I was your most recent joint campaign co-chair for this year. Um, and I'm here to introduce Corey. Uh, over the last few years, I have gotten to know Corey and have had the chance to work with him on many, many occasions, including our wildly successful Golden Gala in early this year. Uh, Corey is competent and kind, and for me, that is the highest compliment that I can give anyone because, trust me, there are so many <laughs> competent people who are not kind and vice versa. In a county, in a county that is as young and diverse as Arlington, it matters to have party leadership that is reflective of the people. Looking ahead to the 24 presidential and 25 gubernatorial elections, Arlington is going to play a big role. When it comes to statewide elections, I know that you know that this county is key to turning Virginia blue. With that in mind, it is even more critical that Arlington has a passionate, personable, and organized person at the helm. That's why I am supporting Corey Barton to be the next deputy chair of the Arlington Democrats, and I hope you will join me in supporting him. And I am way running out of time without further ado. Corey. Good evening, Arlington Democrats. Good evening. Uh, my name is Corey Barton. Uh, I'm running to be your next deputy chair. Tonight, I want to share the story of a young man whose life has been defined by finding courage through adversity. A young man who has endured struggle to find the hope, opportunity, grit, and faith that can move mountains. My story. You see, I grew up in a, in a home where we didn't always know where our next meal was coming from, or if we'd have money to keep electricity and gas on. I know what it feels like to be homeless and how impossible the dream of owning a home can feel. And yes, in my brown skin, I know a bit about how much harder that can make these battles feel. But I also know how opportunities like a full scholarship can open doors for people in my shoes. As a first generation college student, the first person in my family to own a home, I know a lot about the sacrifices made to get here, and I have a profound gratitude for my ancestors and strong Democrats like each and every one of you who fought with bravery and dignity so that I could even be before you tonight. I now find myself in a position to help lead a party who can help deliver this American dream to more people like me. I share my story not for you to feel sorry for me, but so that you know where my values are and how hard I'm going to work on behalf of our party. That's why I've devoted the last decade to serving rights and Democrats at every level, 
On top of everyday volunteering, I've also been a precinct captain, an Arlington Young Dems executive board member, a campaign manager, a campaign treasurer, joint campaign co-chair in the last presidential election, a national delegate for President Biden, inclusion and equity chair, and for the last two years as your parliamentarian. Through this experience, I know a great deal about the quiet diligence needed to keep the party's wheels turning, the resolve required to guide the party through difficult times, the work it takes to reach agreement on difficult issues, and the importance of leading with empathy and the benefits of an organized leader at the helm. The deputy chair serves for 24 and 25. We need a, someone who is organized, experienced, passionate, who has the time to put in the work to not only win, but energize our party so that we can continue being the local and beyond Arlington juggernaut that we are. If elected, I promise to actively listen, be accessible, and continue working hand in hand with our chair and functional areas to modernize and streamline our operations in a manner that respects the contributions of our hardworking volunteers. I am humbled by the support this campaign has received from every leadership level who has recognized my commitment to service, from precinct captains to elected leaders to being endorsed by our current deputy chair, Mike Henninger. I'm fully committed to continue to work with our chair to keep our house in order so we can focus on re-electing President Biden and Vice President Harris in 24 and electing a Democrat as Virginia's governor in 2025. I hope to earn your support and your vote on January 3rd. Thank you. Thank you, Corey, right on the three minute mark. Uh, let's see, uh, Paul, is anyone introducing? Right here. Yep, Malinowski. <laughs> Good evening, Arlington Democrats. I'm Kit Malinowski, and it's my great pleasure to introduce and endorse Paul Ruiz uh, for deputy chair of the Arlington Democrats. And here's why. So the Arlington Democrats, in the last year, we won the last two presidential margins by 70,000 and 80,000 votes plus. How did we do it? We did it by focusing on organizing, on collaborating, and on uh, communicating with our statewide campaigns. And so on collaboration first, Paul Ruiz is somebody who has led the Nova for Biden effort. He has been a joint campaign co-chair and a national convention delegate, among other roles. On organizing, he spearheaded the drive to gather signatures to put Joe Biden on the ballot, gathering, as of today, more than 9,000 signatures and leading that effort across all 11 CDs. And on communications, he's helped build our communications team into having a robust presence on social media, on press releases, on emails, and he works with every part of the committee. So he is truly an outstanding Democrat that will do an outstanding job as deputy chair. We're lucky to have him running. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Paul Reeves, thank you. Thank you, Kip, and good evening, Arlington Democrats. I'm Paul Reeves, I'm running for deputy chair. Next year is consequential for our country and our committee. New volunteers will come in those doors. Donors will, phone, will turn their attention to us. Our email list will swell. How will we build momentum in an otherwise chaotic campaign season? For me, this party and the mission of electing Democrats is deeply personal. I may not look like it, but I was born with a rare condition that limits my visual acuity. I don't drive a car. From a young age, I struggled, and I understood two things about the world. One, that it isn't always fair, but two, that there are good people who are working to make it better. And Arlington Democrats, you are my good people. Every one of our volunteers has a story like that. It, there's a reason that they come through these doors, and I want to build that party. Over the past four years, I have led large campaigns that have mobilized volunteers. In 2020, I led the Northern Virginia, or I was the Northern Virginia organizer supporting the Biden campaign, uh, phone banks and canvassing events. Uh, this year, I led the president's statewide petition. Effort. I will use my experience as an organizer and relationships with the campaign to align our messaging, organize volunteer activities, attract new donors, and grow our reach in and beyond Arlington. We must be lockstep with the national campaign next year. In doing so, I will work directly with the chair. 
Leading communications over the past two years, Steve and I developed a very close relationship. I speak with him about committee business. This is not an exaggeration. Every day, sometimes after midnight. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. <laughs> I will build on my existing relationships of trust with the chair and create alignment from the top down. As communications director, I have visibility into every functional area. I worked with every part of this committee to produce emails, press releases, web updates, social media posts, and digital and print materials. It's a big job, and I could not do it without delegating, being efficient, and collaborating with you. And finally, I will give our teams new digital tools to do outreach. When I ran two years ago, I pledged to focus on accessibility. Video subtitling is an expected practice now. Our materials are in five languages. We tripled the size of the comms team and introduced specialized positions like web analytics. Our committee now tracks the success of our outreach campaigns. And we will continue to do so if I'm elected de uh, deputy chair. I'm proud of that record of accomplishment and I would like to expand our tools across the committee. Let's make this a place that is well run, that where volunteers feel welcome. I will be a deputy chair who listens empathetically, communicates clearly, and acts pragmatically to support the committee. And I'm asking for your vote on January 3rd so that together we can continue building this place together. Thanks. Wow, thank you, Corey and Paul. Two great friends and two great candidates. Look forward to our, our reorg meeting in, in January. All right, so the, the meat of the conversation tonight is going to be around our 2024 school board endorsement vote rules. Um, I think we're not going to have a, a final vote on this tonight, but we're, we're going to try to tee up a preliminary vote and get a feel for uh, what direction uh, you want us to go in on the school board endorsement vote. I did send around our new set of rules uh, in my email a couple days ago. Hopefully everyone got that or got a chance to look at that. Um, we did have a, a pretty robust conversation in our steering committee meeting. Uh, and I'll just give you a little bit of rundown of how that went. Um, uh, our executive director, uh, Howard Slotke, wrote up a, a very respectable uh, set of rules based on our, our previous process and uh, methodology. I did kind of commit at the end of that meeting that I would go look at election buddy and see if, uh, if there was an alternative method of voting available. Uh, the conversation at the steering committee meeting sort of resolved, revolved around uh, how we tabulate that vote. And of course, something that we've all cared about and all wanted to do in, in past years is have some form of uh, you know, virtual vote or early vote at home vote for people that have trouble making it to our school board endorsement vote process. What I discovered uh, is that uh, election buddy does have a pretty robust system now that incorporates a lot of the things that we want to do as a committee. Uh, namely, it and go to the next slide. I think the uh, there is a oh okay. Well, keep it keep it there. I guess I think there's a QR code if people want to pull up the uh, if you care to pull up the rules, they're there. Um. So, so election buddy does offer a process where you could, you still need to send in your pledge form. In exchange for that, you would get a link in your email where you're able to vote. Uh, if you want to come to our school board endorsement vote event, we are still going to have our three prescribed events uh, spread across the second week in May. Thank you. Uh, right before the district convention. So you can show up at our school board endorsement vote in person, fill out your pledge form, get the same sort of key code. Uh, instead of getting a paper ballot, you'll walk over to a laptop, fill out your ballot there. Uh, the, the good news is that at the end of the day, at 7 p.m. when voting closes, uh, the teller process is pretty much replaced um, by us just sort of pressing the close button and having election buddy do the tabulation for us. 
they do use um, for nomination processes where there is more than one nominee, they do use the same method used by the county single transferable vote, which I know some people had questions about uh, last year. Um, but there, there you have it. There we have two sets of rules right now. Uh, our standard set of rules and one that incorporates an early voting process and one that incorporates uh, a ranked choice voting process um, that has been adopted by the county and adopted by the Commonwealth of Virginia. So I will open the floor to questions. No sense in me doing this entire uh, conversation. Uh, Bob. I, I would just like to just speak out in favor of your proposed election budget alternative. One, it, it goes a long way to, to boosting the opportunity to participate. Uh, you don't have to go to just one place in a few hours. Two is that it does really honor the, the IRB uh, principle and, and really does provide us with, with a good way to select two nominees for school board, which is what we're trying to do. And third is that I think that in terms of election security, it is just as secure as our current process. Uh, you know, instead of devoting our, our man hours to, to tabulating, we can devote our man hours to protecting and auditing and assuring that we have a very sound, robust, untampered with system. So I highly endorse it. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I will add two, just two additional points. So I did, Fairfax County did use this system uh, last year in their endorsement process, one. Uh, second, I did have a conversation with Dave Lightman today, who's very familiar with election buddy. And he also spoke in favor of us trying that system. Debbie Kittle. I think we don't like the, the single transferable uh, vote method. There's two, there's at least two uh, methods of brain choice voting. And we always use a method, I believe we always use a method, the different method where it's really like a um, instant runoff, multiple instant runoffs versus two candidates. But now this is this is the this is the kind of brain choice voting that the that the the county uses. Um, and it lowers the threshold for winning a seat. Um, and so that if, it, if there's multiple candidates, uh, multiple candidates, uh, multiple eligible elections. Um, and so I'll just give you my bottom line. I think we should do it because within the Democratic Party, I don't think it's going to be too much of a problem if we lower the threshold for winning. <laughs> but uh, but in, a, in an election between Democrats and Republicans, I really don't like the transferable election. Thank, thank you so much. No, no, thank, thank you so much. Every voice is welcome. We want every voice heard. Um, let's go to Mary Detweiler. Yeah, yeah, no, great question. And uh, you know, I talked to Dave for about 15 minutes and uh, uh, apparently had, hadn't made it clear to Dave either. So that's a really great catch. Every voter votes on election money. So if you vote early because you got an email link, uh, you hit that link, uh, we give you a code, you put in your code, you vote on election money. If you show up at our traditional in-person school board caucus, we're not going to hand you a paper ballot. We're going to give you a, a key code and walk you over to a laptop where you're going to stand and vote right onto the election by the system. They, they do allow other methods. They allow you to print ballots. Uh, but if we use that method, we would then have to 
hand all those ballots to an Arlington Democrat volunteer and have them individually enter all the ballots uh, as they came in or after they came in. So it's, it's a little more direct uh, to, to do it the first way. The details of which really have not made it entirely into our current set of rules, which why tonight we're just kind of having a general philosophical conversation about it and hopefully a, a vote on which method we prefer. Um, I see some hands in the back. Yes, sir, I saw your, did see your hand first. Yeah, I'm talking about just the election vote. There's a Thank, thank you so much. Meg Flores. Great question. So, so they do allow multiple um, voting options. And I'm just off the top of my head, I'm going to say, you know, we could trot someone out there with a tablet and let the person vote on a tablet, or Election Buddy does let you print out uh, a number of printed ballots too. If we, you know, kept that to curbside and provisional balancing, you know, that would be a manageable number of ballots to manually enter, but a, a tablet doesn't sound like a bad option either. Mark? My memory, do we have money to or get a license? So that, that's actually, and Mark asked if we have uh, the funds uh, to do it. I think it was the gist of it. That, that's sort of the good news. Uh, under the, if I don't know if people remember, a number of years ago, we got like a $60,000 grant to do online voting. Election Buddy will give you 5,000 uh, key codes for balloting. Uh, for like $299. Uh, so the the cost point is just crazy efficient uh, from our standpoint, I think. There will be some promotion. We'll probably be mailing pledge forms. You know, there are going to be additional costs associated with that. Uh, but definitely the cost of the platform is next to nothing. Sarah Lambert. And sorry, then Barbara, Paul will come back to you. So much sooner, but in great context. Paul Athenia has had her hand up. Um, I agree with what Terry just said, but what Beth said is really, really important. And I actually made the motion to endorse or whatever in the steering committee the first draft of the rule because the calculation method was not this one. This is the one used by the council. We have not used it. My understanding is. That in previous school board endorsement races, we've used a different method wherein you your vote gets what Beta said. Please use what Beta said because <laughs> it's not going to make sense. But essentially, what happened was the county counties are on precinct level. We got one vote for two places, so your vote only counts one. And I really have trouble with that. I love this idea. I'm glad you found the information, but I don't like the way they calculate it. And I'm not sure if I have to go right this minute with my own vote. Sure. sure. Uh, and I can add some clarity to that, but I see we've got a couple other hands up. Um, I think I saw Christina's first. Yeah. Um, I will speak as someone who was elected to the IRB and was elected the last time that we did a non in person caucus because we have to do virtual. And if you recall the metrics on that, having the mail in vote ended up actually increasing turnout. It was the highest caucus we'd ever had. Um, it was a ton of work. It was an obscene amount of work. It was incredibly expensive. 
and also having that accessibility pay off in spades. And so I think that being able to do that at this much, much, much lower price point will absolutely be incredibly valuable. And we'll start with many, many people who are not able to access the ballot being able to do so. Um, I agree with the question about IRV versus single transferable. And I think it would cost, it would be good for us to see if, if election buddy has the option. Um, and also, I don't think that scrapping election buddy at the expense of if we're sitting, debating between single transferable versus IRV, I think the overall value add of bringing the vote to the voter is more important than the, the small delta that it will give us in terms of viability. Um, and also, it is on all of us to ensure that we are encouraging incredibly viable, wonderful candidates to run for these positions so that we end up with someone who doesn't have All right, I saw a bunch of hands. Let me go to Brian. So I did, I was part of the team to help speed research on this. So the election that we offer is also going to take care of the results. Um, the results are audited by a group of professionals that election that we um, hire. So, um, you know, neutrality in that process. Also, just to double check the um, election buddy website, they offer translation services to 30 languages. Um, so there's a connection. Uh, and a couple of them are the most um, popular. Most well, commonly spoken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> most commonly spoken uh, languages here in Arlington. Uh, and so. Much better than that, and we've also used it in the past for the bond and vote um, during COVID as well. So there is precedent of us using it for our endorsement process here within um, the party, and we can adjust the method if we decide so we like the software, but we're having issues on how it's calculated. We can, we can, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll double check that, but okay. we should Thanks. be able to. Let's go to Bob. Yeah, I I just wanted to speak out in favor of single transport votes. Basically, what we did in the last two school board races where there were two seats was a gerrymandered thing because we didn't have the, the software to do it the, the traditional way, the way that it's been done in multi-seat elections in, in Italy, everywhere you can think of for years. And the the main advantage to doing it this way, although it may not be psychologically satisfying for people to vote, is that it discourages sort of collusion. Uh, that is to say that you have an election with people that had exactly the same sentiment. And in one, you had a great deal of discipline saying, vote for guy A first and guy B second. And they get a different result with that sort of collaboration then they would if everybody just happened to vote their first choice for A and their second choice for B and vice versa. The, the single transferable vote does a better job of sorting out those preferences without without benefiting collusion. That's the main difference between the two techniques. Now, and and the, the way we did just to sort of tune in, then I'll come back to you. To describe the process that we did uh, ourselves uh, last time around, it, uh, I think we counted as if it was a single candidate election and went through it, one, through it once and then eliminated that person as if they dropped out of the race and then ran through it again as a single person's election the second time. Yeah, that's correct. That's how we did yeah. it. Let, let me get these people that had your power. You had your hand up. I did. I, although I'm just repeating what you know several people have already said before. I mean, I don't like the single transferable vote method either. I think it's complicated and it's poorly understood. I think that may be one of the reasons the county board did not use it in the general election. But having said that, the advantages of election buddy, you know, outweigh my concerns with single transferable vote. I mean, election buddy is, you know, going to increase, I'm sure, participation. Uh, it's going to eliminate any errors. You know, the computer's not going to let you vote, you know, like, first place for two different candidates. You know, we're, you're, we won't have to worry about, you know, erroneously filled out ballots. The election results will be done instantaneously. Just press a button now, you know, after the last day of voting and you know, we get the results. We don't need a teller committee. Uh, there's just a ton of advantages associated with election buddy. And as you pointed out, it's cheap. So uh, I'm thinking, you know, my concerns about single transfer will vote are outweighed by the efficiencies 
associated with flex trading. And let me get a couple of people that haven't spoken yet. Sarah and Florence, I see your hand up. Yes, Right, but only for the primary. We didn't use it in the, the primary, not the general and, election. And it is, let me just stress that it is less uh, damaging, it's less risky for all, all around Democrats. Because the only thing that they can about, so in, in, in the system that Steve described, you had to get, eventually, you had to get over 50%. People had to get to the back end, they got over 50%, the threshold was 50 in, even in the multiple campaigns, multiple alternate elections. But in, in uh, transferable, in single transferable votes, if you had four openings, for example, if you got over 21% of the vote, you got one of those officials. And that is the difference. It lowers the threshold in multi opening um, elections. And I want to say one more thing. Even though I don't really don't like uh, Single transferable vote. The system, I think, it's so the inclusion point is so important, and we really need to get this underway. So, and it is all amongst Democrats. So, I think I, I'm going to vote for it. And so, just to uh, give you my opinion on it, you know, I think the way it plays out this year, because um, there are two school board seats that we're endorsing for, um, you know, I just would be surprised if there were more than three or four candidates. So I don't think this will be as great a test of the single transferable vote system as it will be a test for how, you know, how many more voters or what greater turnout can we get by having uh, you know, the additional options uh, for voting. I could be wrong, but uh, Phoebe? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I just want to speak out in favor of single transferable vote. Of course, it's proportional, I think, is the best thing, as we saw, even in the Democratic primary, that's important, because as we saw with county board elections, say, this year, we've got one pro, which is one not so pro candidate, you can have the same on the school board, where it isn't just sort of it gets more than people to turn out. Um, you also do sort of get two votes for two seats, because if your first candidate gets eliminated, of course, it's redistributed, it counts this voting, but second, if your candidate finishes first, and hits the threshold, then it is also redistributed to the candidates remaining. So it is actually the ideal election system. They used it in Ireland, and they've used it since 1918 or something. And I, I just wanted to praise that. Thank, thank you so much. All right, I, I, yeah. I just have to go back to the question of the Democrats. Yeah. Because I think that the Democrats have been very strong in the last couple of years. They have been very strong if your candidate is first, you only a small proportion possibly of your second choice vote will get you this vote. So go go to go to the websites, understand the vote that the system is It's not all redistributed. But in, in ranked choice voting, I think none of it's redistributed, right? You just peel from the bottom and, and redistribute from the bottom. You go through one our old system, you go through one election yeah. and you just keep picking it each time. And then then the second election happens and you're set to choice, but there's two openings. Yeah. You get a full choice of your second choice. And you don't. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, can I back up super basic question? Never use election buddy. Yeah. <laughs> how, how do you 
how do you register to vote and vote? Like what stops someone from filling in my information and voting? As great, great question. So we, we will retain uh, the two components of our process. Uh, well, the, the pledge form, which uh, the state party plan requires us to use, uh, we're going to keep that. Uh, and then we use our uh, voter database, the VAN, to uh, do a quick check method. Anyone who fills out a pledge form, we go into the VAN, we check the box, say that we have given them a ballot or a key code to vote. Uh, and by that way, we hopefully prevent anyone from showing up as two people. All right. So there, when it was. There's no concern about like a monster liberty. <laughs> it's, no, I'm serious. Like, no, 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 I'm serious. It, it's the exact same process we've used uh, year after year after year, and we've not had that problem previously. So, I, I, yeah. Steve, you're saying is I have to mail in a pledge form in advance to you before you give me a key code. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I think the van the details we have yet to work out. Yeah. <laughs> so, I would like to, uh, Rachel, and we're going to wrap this up in a, in a moment. So they do, but for two nominees, I think you're you're looking at the single transferable vote. Yeah, that's where we are. Sarah. Yeah. So so we're not voting on a final set of rules tonight, but I, I would like to see us sort of vote on a preference for this process. So would anyone care to make a motion for this? New set of rules and methods. Christina Diaz Flores. I move to the uh, set of rules that include election body forward for a full vote for the body in January. In January. Second. Brian second, Christina no. first. Thank you so much. Um, any additional discussion or can we go ahead and proceed to the vote? Thank you so much. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All right, uh, drop your hands. All those opposed, please raise your hands. All right, the eyes clearly have it. Um, that motion passes. Howard, uh, you are authorized to continue working on those rules and working out the details. We will bring the final set of rules to our reorg meeting in January. Um, there, there you have it. We do have one more speaker before the cookies. So, Please let me welcome up school board member Christina Diaz Torres. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, today is a bittersweet moment for me as I share some important, important decision with you all. After careful consideration, I decided that we will in fact need these rules that we were talking about because I will not be seeking re-election for another term as a member of the Arlington School Board. It has been a, it has been an incredible journey, and I am so very grateful for the trust and support that you all have bestowed upon me during the last three years in particular, but ever since I moved to Arlington. Um, and I have some reflections that I want to share. It's wild to think about how much has changed since I was sworn in. I started my term January 1st, 2021, in a world of truly wild uncertainty. My first day in office, schools were closed, we were in fully virtual instruction, and hardly anyone we knew had been vaccinated. The end of the pandemic was nowhere near being in sight, and these were really dark days. I remember the deep-seated worry that consumed us all and the panic that we all felt every time we left our homes. Just three years later, the world looks a lot brighter. Our schools are open, students are learning, and as I walk through schools this semester, there's an innate sense of calm that is unlike any school environment I've ever seen before. As a part of this job, I spend a lot of time talking to our staff, and especially our school leaders, and the sentiment I'm hearing over and over again is how different this year feels. 
It's not a return to the before times that we were all longing for, but to the after times, something new, something different, and something that we were longing for all of those months. And as I look back on how we got there, I'm filled with, I'm filled with a sense of pride. We have met Avenue, the winding road and covered with COVID recovery, and we have worked to address the underlying challenges that APS faced as a school district before the pandemic even hit us. The reasons that I ran for school board in the first place. When I talk about why I ran for the school board and apologies to the YDs who've heard this story twice in a week, uh, I often tell the story of the class of 2019. In the class of 2019 of APS, we had 99 students drop out. Of those 99 students, 90 of them were black and Latino. The vast majority of them were boys and more than half have been with APS since elementary school. That's just one metric, but it is one that's indicative of the problems that we faced and that we still face today. A school system that's successful as APS in a community that's as incredible as Arlington must be able to work for all students, regardless of their needs, regardless of their background, and regardless of the support necessary for them to learn. Now, at the end of my term, or three years into my term, are we there yet? Not yet. But there's a lot that I'm very proud of that we've done in the last three years. In just a short time, we have restructured the organization to put instruction and student experience at the center and to be more responsive to the needs of students, staff, and community members. We completely shifted our approach to literacy to align with how the brain learns how to read. And in just two academic years, our new investments have resulted in over a thousand more students being identified for support and the new curriculum resulted in achievement gap drops among every single subgroup on the Info Wells last year. We introduced substantive changes in our student code of conduct, reducing opportunities for students to be overly policed in schools or removed from student learning unnecessarily. And in one year, we reduced the out-of-school suspension rate for our Black students by 9%. I cannot underestimate how important that single number is. These are children who were being taken out of classrooms because of behaviors that represented needs that were unmet, which meant that they weren't able to learn. Those 9% represent students who are now able to stay in the classroom and are able to continue their learning. We have invested in unprecedented ways in our staff through compensation increases that brought every single one of our pay scales up to competitiveness with neighboring jurisdictions. And I'm proud to say that we were one of the first jurisdictions in the Commonwealth to successfully reintroduce collective bargaining for our employees. We have one of new place right now, and I am very optimistic based on the reports of what I'm hearing and what I'm being reported on um, our current negotiations that all of our bargaining unit employees will be under a CBA at the beginning of next fiscal year. And we did all of this under the, the sombering weight of the mental health crisis in our community, and we invested heavily to address it. If there's one thing that the last three years have shown us is that we bring our whole selves. We bring our strengths, we bring our challenges, we bring our baggage, we bring our anxieties, we bring our joys and our fears every time we walk into a school or we walk into work. We've invested heavily in mental health at APS, uh, both on our own and with our, community, with our county partners. Um, but I want to be clear that this is by no means enough. Uh, there are so many current and future leaders in the room, so I am going to take a brief point of advocacy and just say this. For too long, our schools and our educators in particular have borne the burden of inadequate social safety nets. We must eliminate the support cap. We must fully fund mental health support for students in schools. And at the federal level, we must fully fund IDEA so that our students with disabilities can get the support that they need to them. Then and only then will our educators be able to focus on their primary job, educating children. I'm very proud of what we've achieved, and I want to give credit where credit is due. First of all, to our incredible staff. Every school that I walk through, I get the privilege of witnessing our incredibly talented staff here at APS. From the teachers to the instructional coaches, the support staff, the custodians, the front desk clerks, our school leaders, our operations staff, literally every single person on this team is absolutely amazing. Um, and absolutely is like none. It's because of their dedication, their passion, and their commitment to the students that we are the incredible school system that we are today. Next, I have to recognize our cabinet, spearheaded by our fearless superintendent, Dr. Francisco Luran, 
In the past three years, we've gone farther and faster in addressing the structural inequities of our system because of their willingness to understand the underlying issues, to really dig deep, to question and push the status quo, and to find solutions that enable adults to make decisions in the best interest of kids. Finally, I do have to recognize, even though they're not here today, my colleagues, Monique, Barbara, Reed, Mary, Bethany, and Dave. I joke that we are trauma bonded together through this experience. But the reality is that the APS school board has a level of collaboration, camaraderie, and professionalism that's incredibly rare in this industry. We do serious work, but we also don't take ourselves too seriously. We have to have some, get to have some joy in the process. And it is so important that we do this work. Serving our community together at this particular moment has been a uniquely rewarding experience, and I'm so grateful to each of them for having served alongside them. I'm proud of the initiatives that we've undertaken in the last three years. I'm proud of the policies that we have implemented. I'm proud of the incredibly positive changes that we've brought to our schools. We've strived to create an educational system that prepares our students for the challenges and uncertainties of the future, which is why this makes us a hard decision. And I'm gonna cry. My decision to step down at the end of the term is not a farewell, but rather an opportunity for new leadership to emerge and to step into this space. I have full confidence in this community, and I have full confidence that there are passionate, caring, equity-minded individuals here who will step up to the plate and will continue the important work that we've started. As I pass the torch, I'm optimistic that whoever sits in the seat will continue the legacy of collaboration, and to borrow the previously borrowed quote from a colleague, that they will continue to make the main thing the main thing. As incredible as we are as a school system, and as incredible as we are as a community, we will not be excellent until and unless we are able to meet every single student by name, strength, and need every single day. So in closing, I want to express my deepest gratitude to all of you who have been a part of this incredible journey. This chapter will forever hold a special place in my heart and will be among the most significant and impactful work I've ever done. The next chapter is going to look a little different as I take on the new role of being mom to a future APS grad of 2014. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, but I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> and I look forward to bearing witness to the continued success and prosperity of Arlington Public Schools. Thank you for the honor and the privilege of serving as your member of your school board for the last three years. Um, I'm excited to finish the work over the course of the next year until the end of my term. And together, let's continue to build a bright and promising future for the next generation of our little children. Wow, thank you so much, Christina. Let me bring up uh, Sarah Lampert. Without a hard act to follow. <laughs> and I was the one who was complaining about the cookies. And here I am. Uh, next slide, please. I'll make this quick. Um, I really just wanted to start by thanking each of the over 700 people who turned out on election day to help turn out the vote and get people to vote. I'm so proud. These are just a few of the familiar faces who were out on election day all day. Um, we did it, and we we're going to do it again next year. <laughs> so, uh, please save the date. That'll be Tuesday, November 5th. Um, and if you're if you're new here, because I'm seeing some faces I've never seen before, do find me, get a cookie and find me, and we'll chat about how you can get involved. Um, we'd love to have you on Precinct Ops, and if not as a Precinct Option, then um, at the polls next year at the very least. So thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who was a poll reader. Next slide, please. Uh, Fran doesn't know I'm doing this, but our precinct ops member of the month is Fran Jackson. You may think it's on the slide that I'm being dramatic, but I do think I would die without her. <laughs> Um, if not die, I would lose all mental capacity and I would go insane. So either way, uh, crucial to my well-being is Fran Jackson. Um, she moves in silence, but does more than anyone I think in this room knows besides me. Um, and I really do think Precinct Ops wouldn't be half of what it is without her steadfast leadership, her patience, and her humor. I think um, uh, Paul talked about how he's talking to Steve after midnight. Fran and I are talking all day, every day. So I'm really glad I like her. 
Um, and, and in fact, I love her. So big, big. Um, Okay, um, and then finally, we are launching a Precinct Off book club as a way to keep our Precinct team engaged throughout 2024, um, but I will say it is open to anyone, the more the merrier. Um, we will meet once a month starting in January. Do stay tuned for info on when and where that will be. Um, and we are going to do, by popular demand from the area chairs, Democracy Awakening by Heather Cox Richardson, so uh, go ahead and grab that from bookshop.org or the local library. Uh, could be a fun little Christmas gift for you there. Nothing like reading about the decline of American institutions for you. Uh, but we'll read about it and then talk about ways we as a community can work together to overcome that. So join us in reading this book. Thank you, thank you, thank you again to everyone who's part of Precinct Ops. Happy holidays, and I will turn it back over to Steve. All right, Kevin or Tony. Kevin, come on up. I'm sure oh, Tony's here too. Yeah. Well, why did I come? <laughs> no, uh, yeah, real quick, uh, you can do the next slide. Thank you. Um, so thank you to everyone on the team. We did the early voting poll reading team. I think 100% of that of us are here tonight. The three of the three. Paul is over here. Paul Petey and Tony Strider. Can we can we do applause for the? And if I can say thank you to all the volunteers who were out on the ground, standing in the, the hot, cold, wind, the rain, everything. So it's really, yeah, look at all these we got looking at here. 87 volunteers, so 226 early voting spots, plus three different sites. It was a very big effort, and it took a very long time to set up the page for all of those. So I'm glad they were used. Um, <laughs> Now, looking forward, uh, into 2024, there are likely going to be more sites, which means we need more people. Uh, yeah, so so we've got a lot more work to do next year, and uh, I'm very excited. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. yeah. <laughs> we didn't plan this. So we're oh, I know we're team. Oh, how many are team? But uh, um, I see so, Brian Steve. Did it? Yes. Uh, thank you so much. To the right team. Uh, one of the two is here, the other is probably online. So thank you, Anne, and thanks, thanks to everyone. Um, that was a, a unexpectedly slower year for that effort, but uh, but important nonetheless. And uh, we've already got plans. I've, I've seen some email traffic and some plans in the works already for next year. So that's fantastic. And um, and thank you to colleagues here too. And, and um, Promise where I keep going. I know, I know that you, Colleen and Zach, have been working together, and that falls under the other team, but uh, always with the voter registration efforts and well appreciated by our team as well. So thank you. Okay. Oh, and um, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, not running again. Uh, Tony's running on a phone, I guess. So, yeah. um, so, okay. So I don't have to do any endorsements or non endorsements. <laughs> so, I'm not doing um, so thank you, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And then, 24 represents and 25 as well represent a really uh, potent opportunity for us to get into areas of the community that we haven't before in the same way. And I'm excited to work with people who've been with the team before, people who are with the team now, people with the team who will be with the team this year. Uh, and so I'm really excited to really fire up our voter registration, voter information efforts uh, more than we have in the last couple of years and, and keep that early voting full reading energy high. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing what we do. So once again, my name is Tony Strider. So if you need a name to the face or a face to the name, <laughs> here we are. So thank you all very much. And I'll, I'll get you on with me. Yep. Yep. <laughs> all right. Uh... Good evening, everyone. Again, I'm Kit Malinowski. I'm a former precinct captain, a former chair of precinct operations, uh, and a former party chair, too. Uh, but I want to say uh, just uh, real quick, being a pitch, uh, make a pitch for being a precinct captain is one of the best ways to get involved. Uh, it really does. You get to know your neighbors, you get to make a difference right there at the local level, and I'm going to connect that right to what we have to talk about with Beyond Arlington, which I have some good news with Beyond Arlington. If we could go to the next slide. We won! <laughs> Uh, so, uh, a few things that we won. 
Uh, we held the state senate uh, by how many seats? One. One. We took back the House of Delegates by how many seats? And uh, the great news about this is that we did also end uh, Governor Youngkin's presidential ambition. <laughs> Um, now, here's how we won. First, House of Delegates. Uh, all right, the math is not important, but you can do some adding and division. Uh, but what you'll come up with is around uh, 4,000 votes is what we won the House of Delegates with. Now, uh, since we got all these precinct captains in this room, and again, thank you for doing that work. It is so absolutely critical. But basically what that means is about three or four votes per precinct um, in three districts are what gave us the majority in the House of Delegates. So now let's move to the Senate. In the Senate, we got uh, we won by over seven thousand votes. So we have to go up to about you know ten or eleven votes per precinct. Uh, but uh, but again, it was close. Our efforts paid off. We started canvassing um, back in April of 2023. The first phone bank we did was around then. It was for Josh Cole, and we were calling in his home precinct. And that first night of calling, we recruited four volunteers for his campaign um, out of uh, his uh, home precinct and everything. So some fantastic work that was done there. And now what that means, because it's not enough just to win and say we won, um, we actually are moving forward, like uh, Delegate Lopez could tell us uh, all about, we are moving forward on amending Virginia's Constitution in three key ways, and they're listed up here. But the first one is an amendment to protect abortion rights. An amendment to repeal that hateful uh, Marshall Newman amendment to ban gay marriage. We're going to recognize marriage equality in Virginia. And an amendment to do what the governor won't do, which is restore the rights of uh, returning citizens in Virginia. And the great thing, now this takes some time, it's not going to happen immediately, it's good. we have to do two successive votes and then a vote um, in November, um, so this is going to take a couple of years, uh, but the great part is also the governor has no role in it and cannot veto uh, this great progress. So, very good job, well done on 2023. There's next year. I don't know if you read the paper or uh, if you read the Washington Post or the Atlantic, uh, but there are some scary stories out there. Um, we absolutely need to win in 2024. We have to win the presidential election. We need to hold the Senate majority and we need to take back the House of Representatives. And we're down five seats, except wait, we're down four seats because actually, wait, wait, me, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we got a little animation here too, but uh, George Santos, bye-bye. Uh, 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 the governor today of New York said that February 13th is going to be the special election date in New York in, in, in Congressional District 3. Uh, we will likely know our nominee tomorrow. Um, they, they, they're, they are not doing a primary. The state party chair is just announcing the nominee, so whoever it is, that's, that's what we're going to call for, because the alternative is a republic. Um, and so, again, yeah, we cut the majority to four, and so we got a little animation here, too, I believe. Oh, it didn't make it, but that's all right. Here's where it is. Um, New York's third congressional district. Um, it takes a while to drive there. I'm committed to driving there at least twice, and I'm hoping that I have a couple people join me. Uh, but it's going to be really easy to call there. And I'm going to start making a lot of calls, because I think we can win this seat. This is a very close seat. And we can make calls. And let me say, you know, in Virginia, we won. In Kentucky, we won. Um, in Ohio, we won. When we do the work, we win. You know, if the work does not happen, like in Louisiana, then we can lose. But if we do the work in calling folks and getting the word out, we can make this happen. So this is that district that can cut that Republican majority down to four. And if we go to this next slide, we've got a, a QR code that goes to a Google form, and it allows you to rate your interest on, will you be able to join me in making some phone calls? Uh, and we don't even know who the nominee is yet, but I want to follow up on this. But please, I'm not gonna, I'm, I, I'm not gonna commit you to phone call, and this just ask you to rate your interest and making calls, rate your interest in knocking doors in this district, uh, and rate your interest uh, in attending or even hosting a fundraiser. But please, if we could all just take a moment and just 
fill out this form because I really think this is absolutely critical to take back the seat. And uh, so beyond Arlington does not beyond Arlington 2024 does not start in 2024. Beyond Arlington 2024 starts today. I'd love to have your help and join you. And I thank each and every one of you for taking the time to come to this meeting and for your interest in uh, in American democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. All right, let's bring up uh, Outreach, Sangita. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, so as you know, we had our Fusion Festival last month. Uh, this was a, a very a, a team effort. It was a lot of um, Ball, uh, balls in the air, and sadly, I could not attend that I attended attend the event I envisioned because I got COVID. Um, so I was in bed with 102 fever. But anyway, um, so yes, it was a we called it Fusion Festival because it was a joint effort with the Latino Caucus. As you know, they do their lat, uh, the Hispanic Heritage Month festival at Lava Run. Um, and and then the uh, AANHPI caucus, formerly known as AAPI caucus, uh, does the Wally, but just you know, with a lot of Beyond Arlington events and everything, we decided to join the two together and do this fusion festival, um, you know, celebrating the heritage of um, Hispanic, Her Hispanic Heritage Month and uh, the Wally. So since I was not there, um, I'm going to have pass it on to Alexandra. She's just going to say a quick few words. Okay. So yes, um, as Sanjito was mentioning, this is a very unique opportunity for us to bring those different cultures together and then actually talk about what those, some of those traditions um, had in common, including having offerings. So we had our first ever ofrenda that we do for um, Day of the Dead. Um, and we we had um, activities for kids. We had different food vendors. It was quite an elaborate event, and it was right here. It feels, in some ways, it feels like yesterday. In some ways, it feels like a million years ago. But um, and it was one more opportunity for us to get in front of a diverse set of voters here in Arlington and have different community leaders speak about the importance of engagement um, as well shortly before our election. So we really appreciate those of you who made it out and were supported in different ways. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so um, we have continued being busy and over the last month with different activities organized by our caucuses. Our labor caucus has been a strong um, ally for those Starbucks workers that are seeking to unionize and make sure that there are fair working conditions in all locations. So this was um, held in um, Boston, my, my neighborhood precinct. This was on Red, uh, Red Cup Day, which is the um, busiest sales day for Starbucks during the holiday season. So we were out there talking to consumers about the importance of standing with the workers. It was Red Cup Rebellion. And so a lot of engagement, a lot of people appreciate what we were we were doing. And then there was um, the Starbucks workers um, at the courthouse location were striking that morning. Okay, so my name is Brittany Rauchery, and my co founder is Sarah um, Lawrence. Um, we're the Go Chair of the Women's Caucus. Um, last time, I just want to give you a heads up, I totally bombed in front of everybody. <laughs> so I came prepared. Um, I just want to thank all the women in the crowd and everyone else for this election. Like it means a lot. And thank you, Colleen. I see you in the crowd. You were a big part of putting this on and helping me plan all these beautiful uh, gift baskets for everyone. Um, we had a great turnout, and uh, I just I can't thank you all enough. And I hope we have a great turnout next year. It really, it's important. Can you do the next slide? So yes, this Saturday, the outreach team is just getting together for a uh, team building event, but we have a couple spots available. So if anyone would like to join us, um, it's gonna be at that uh, escape room on, on Columbia Pike. And uh, that's a Saturday at 11 a.m. And um, next, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so this um, December 17th is the Disability 
Simply just pocket meeting, it's virtual. Um, Daniel, do you have anything to say? Thanks, Nikita. I uh, just want to say um, that uh, we're, we're going to be getting organized for, uh, for, for 2024. It's going to be a big year, important year for disability rights, and definitely want everybody who is interested in the caucus and participating in the caucus to um, to join us for that meeting because we'll be doing a lot of planning for the, for the year ahead. Hey y'all, uh, so I'll make this really quick because there's cookies waiting in the bag. Uh, come join us on December 19th. We're having our last um, holiday happy hour uh, for the year for the Women's Caucus. We would love to have any and all folks come out for this. Uh, this is especially a great time. We're currently looking for more officers and other people who are interested in being more involved and just coming to our events. Um, so if you are interested in taking on a role, please come out, um, or you can alternatively get in touch with uh, me or Brittany. You can email us at uh, women at Um Yeah, or just come and talk to us. That's great too. Um, and so uh, this will be December 19th from 6 to 7.30 at Screw's Top Wine Bar uh, over in Clarendon. So it's also metro accessible if you don't drive. Um, and we're also uh, going to be we're, like doing a winter clothing drive as well. Um, we are going to be accepting uh, winter clothes, both used and gently used. So if you have some old winter coats and things like that hanging around, um, adult only this time, um, only because the charity that we're giving it to does not currently take children's clothes. Um, and we uh, just keep an eye out on social media. Um, we'll, we'll send out a more comprehensive list, but um, adult clothes, winter clothes especially, and necessities. Um, it will be going to path forward um, for our unhoused population here in Arlington. Um, I believe that's it. Do you have any staff? Josh? Um, so, uh, Kip didn't, uh, Kip forgot to mention, uh, we did lots of postcards for some of those candidates. Save that, it for you. There you go. <laughs> Um, the Michael Beggins, uh, Danica Rohn, uh, Josh Cole. Uh, so, you know, uh, add it to the margin there. Um, we have an ambitious goal uh, in 2024 because we have to absolutely just go all out. Um, and we're looking for volunteers. We really need to, um, to staff up to get, uh, get a lot more people to plan postcard parties and canvassing events and other things to get uh, families involved. Uh, we're all about keeping uh, activism social, and uh, we're going to need all of it uh, next year. So, uh, send me an email if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Um, I know everybody's hungry. I just want to say I will not be running for outreach chair for next year, but um, I will use that opportunity to uh, volunteer in all, all the other great subcommittees that we have because you all do such a wonderful job. Uh, that's it. Hi everyone. So this will be my last time up here. I am technically no longer president. I am president emeritus because <laughs> we had our elections a couple weeks ago. Um, but I will get to who our new executive board is in a moment. So just a recap of what happened in November. So first weekend before the election, we GOTV weekend, we were down in Hampton Roads. Um, we got to uh, canvas for New Darius Clark, and we also met activist David Hogg at a couple of um, canvas launches, which was really cool. And then election day, we had a lot of our folks out and about helping out in Arlington. And we also were part of the election night watch party over at Fireworks over in the courthouse. And we also got second place in the BAYD campaign competition, which is honestly like Lono got first and they deserved it. They got so many points more than like everyone else. <laughs> they knocked like 20,000 doors. So good for them. But we had we had a very good showing and it was just really great to see all our volunteers throughout this campaign season make a difference across the Commonwealth and help us 
defend our majority in the Senate and take back the House. So, sorry. <laughs> yes, wait, no, that is correct. I thought I was in my head. Um, but then we had elections on November 16th, and we have a whole new uh, board, and uh, I will show you those on the next slide in a moment. But also, thank you so much to our outgoing 2023 AYD Executive Board, you guys did so much this past year, and you should be incredibly proud of all your work. Um, I'd actually love to give a round of applause for the 2023 Executive Board. <laughs> and we also, this past weekend, um, the uh, Arlington hosted the YDA Winter Meeting that was over in Crystal City, or Pentagon City, one of the two. But BAYD helped out with that, and it was really great. We had a strong showing there as well, and it was great to interact with young Dems from across the country. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I can show you who our new executive board is. So president is Bryant Atkins. Vice president is Phoebe Carlson. His sixth, or his sixth term is Bill Catano. <laughs> uh, our new secretary is Samantha Perez. Our new membership director is Brian Coleman. Our community service director is Rio Simon. Our campaign director is McLean Cochon. And our new political director is Austin Long. Our DNI director is Mark Perlman, again, for his second record. And our party representative is Duncan Barron. So you'll be seeing him at the meetings for Barron. And then our appointed position, our finance director, is going to be Dylan Perlson. Our publicity director is Yint. <laughs> we'll be seeing more of him. Um, programming director is Madison McCabe, who you may recognize from Adele McClure's campaign. Um, our digital director is Abby Chevenet. Our recruitment director is Reagan Bustamante. And our retention director is Andy Style. So that is my 2024 executive board. And of course, I am on as president emeritus. So I'm not going too far. I'll, I'll still be around. But with that, I'm going to hand it off to Bryant and Duncan. And thank you so much again, guys, for everything. Well, hello again. And just another introduction. My name is Bryant Atkins. I was the 2022 party rep um, and decided to stay on with this amazing organization um, and run for president. Um, so excited to work with this great organization. We partnered in so many amazing ways through the 2022 year. Um, I'm excited to work with our um, 2024-2025 Arlington Gym Board, but I know I'm standing between y'all and the cookies. <laughs> um, so I did want to promote one event. Um, Arlington Democrats will be having our annual brunch. Uh, this is where we formally will swear in um, our new board, give out our awards, and then reflect on the year we had and the year we will have um, in 2024. Um, so if you are a dues-paying member, uh, prices are $30. Um, and then it's $40 if you are above the age of 36. Um, but that includes... Uh, the cost of the brunch and one free drink. Um, that will be at Fireworks Pizza, so easily metro accessible. And that is different from our previous years. Um, so please keep that in mind. We hope to see you there. If we can go to the next slide. And since we have some candidate announcements, if you want to sponsor an Arlington Death Brunch, you can come see me or Bill, and we'd be glad to talk. <laughs> Um, and then AYD Awards, um, we have until December 7th at 5 p.m. And that link, we have a great slate of candidates uh, for our awards this year. Um, and we would like to acknowledge uh, all of the hard work. We thank them. Um, and then Reads Across America, we will be doing a delegation to the Reads Across America over at Arlington National Cemetery. 
Everyone is invited to attend. Um, please scan the QR code, and then I will be including our email list as we work out meetup point logistics. Um, other than that, I think that, uh, um, and just a quick reminder, uh, the Washington Post will be on strike tomorrow. Um, um, so please refrain from using any Washington Post or their affiliate media um, for the 24-hour strike. There's plenty of other great news, uh, news sources like your very own local Arlington Now. Um, and then... That's it. All right. Well, I will hand it back to Steve. <laughs> We're done. All right. Go enjoy cookies. <laughs> yeah.